We've been looking at the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Uh, and the critical thing we need to, to address is what kind of book it is, if we're going to make some sense out of it. If it's read simply as a literal description of upcoming events, it can be a very fearful kind of book. But if it's read as an apocalypse, uh, then it becomes hopeful encouragement for us. You know my take on it. It was uh, originally written for these seven faith communities in Asia. Right? They were suffering under a Roman emperor who wanted to be worshipped as God. So it was a powerful word for them, but it still has meaning for us who find ourselves in faith communities that are still seeking to find a way to be faithful in a culture that sometimes doesn't reflect the values that we hold. Again, an apocalypse is art, it's poetry, it's deeply symbolic, it's, it's filled with all kinds of pictures. It's not merely passing on information, but helping us to explore deeply what something means. What does it mean that God is Lord? Uh, it engages our imagination to discern how do we find our way in the midst of life, in the conflict between good and evil. It comes in the form of a dream, and John is transported in this dream to the throne room of God where he records what he sees. Last week we, we saw the talk, talked about the image of the one who's seated on the throne, the creator of all. All creation, all nations, all creatures gather around the throne and bow down to him. So we want to uh, continue our reading uh, from there. Then I saw in the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne a scroll written inside and out and, and sealed with seven seals. I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who's worthy to open the scroll and break the seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or even to look at it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or look at it. The tragedy which prompts these tears for John is that God had a message for us, but we were unable to hear it. How might we hear the message? What is it that God wants to say to us? Let's pick up a verse again. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, for see the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Interesting images here. This, this one who is the lion of Judah, the root of of David. This is messianic language. This is the language they would have associated with, with the Messiah, the one who was to come to make things right on the day of the Lord. Powerful, glorious champion who will turn things around. And John looks for this glorious figure, but what he sees is something quite different. Let's go back to our text. Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth. Okay, there's an image. <laughs> uh, if we take it literally, it produces nightmares, right? We have a name for creatures that are killed and still alive. We call them zombies, right? <laughs> right? So, so here we have something that has been killed but is still alive, covered with horns and eyeballs. Now, if you take that literally, this is, this is a frightening nightmare, not, a, not a, a dream. But if it isn't a description of what Messiah looks like, but rather a description of what, who Messiah is, then it's a different matter. If the horns represent power, eyes represent insight, then we have a being who is stronger than death, even though he was killed is still alive, is stronger than death, is all-powerful is all-knowing and becomes a comforting image for us. This lamb, who is also lion and root, experienced, experienced in so many different ways, says, The lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, the, four, the 24 elders, fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals, 
For you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints of every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. For a culture that had been built upon sacrifice of lambs to atone for, for sins, this would make perfect sense. For us, it's a bit more of a stretch. That's not our, that's not our regular experience. That we find com- that to find comfort, we need to see this through the eyes of those who first heard this message of a lamb that was slain to take away sins. He goes on and says, Then I looked and I, I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and they numbered myriads of myriads, thousands of thousands, singing in full voice, Worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea, all that is in them singing to the one who's seated on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This one that we know as Lamb of God has a unique place in the scheme of things to do for us what we could not do for ourselves, who by a sacrifice triumphs over death. And we heard how gathered around the throne are the, are the people of God. People, all kinds of people. Every tribe and language and nation, um, more than can be numbered. This is not an exclusive gathering. This is universal in its reach, incredible in its scope. In this life, however, we find too often that's not the case. We find ourselves divided by tribe or language or people or nation. Last week, we got to see the ugly part of that, if you watch the news at all. We saw it in uh, hate speech of white supremacy of those who judged others by the pigmentation of their skin or by the faith that they lived by. That kind of racism that we, uh, that just, it's oftentimes there, but we just don't always see it, flies in the face of the image of God that each of us have, right, that Jesus proclaimed. The deal is we live in a country where free speech is protected, even if we don't agree with it, right? What's not protected is creating fear and intimidation for inciting violence. The good news is we have a voice as well, though. We have freedom of speech. We, and it, we cannot be silent in this. There's a guy named Edwin Burke. He wrote something it was a while ago, 275 years ago. He wrote this. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. But what do we do? I mean, violence is not the answer. We know that violence answered with violence simply produces a cycle where it continues. What we can do is name racist and hateful speech for what it is. It is sin. There's no two sides to that. There's no getting around that. Hateful, uh, racist speech is sin. And we can use our voice, our actions to proclaim what is good what is loving. If you haven't been over to the Science Museum lately, I encourage you to make a trip over there. There's an exhibit called Race. Uh, We went there a couple weeks ago. uh, and It's an amazing thing. I I learned so much. Challenge us to think about, I thought I knew what race was and how it came to be and what it meant. Um, And that wasn't the case at all. One thing that becomes clear, though, is is that racism is something that is taught. It's a learned behavior. It's not something we are born with. And it's not going to go away if we ignore it. It needs to be named. An alternative view needs to be lifted up. I came across an interesting video the other day. Uh, Someone simply asked kids, put kids together and said, how are you different from each other?
What makes you two different from each other? Um... I used to not like letters, but now I like letters. I do not like letters at all. Lucy loves tomato sauce, and I, I do like it, but I don't like love it as much as Lucy. Don't have the same. Our alpha is down the hill, and I'm no, down I the hill. No, I live up the hill. No, I have smaller toes than Artie. Addie, I like sushi and chips, and I like sushi. And they're different. She never stops talking. We've got different hair. He, um, Lucian has, that doesn't have squirrels in the roof. We have squirrels mm. in the leaf roof, so we can't watch television that much because it's biting all the wires. Both. I'm good at gymnastics and, and, and Kelly May is good at swimming. I'm not good at dancing. I am. You're a defender and I'm a defender. No, I'm not anymore. I used to be, no, I'm not. No, we're not. What? Good at counting and I'm good at hiding. <laughs> and Matthew's he's, good he's at... He's better at tig. And, Math and Matthew's good at um, staying in den. When it comes to difference, children see things differently. All right. In the aftermath of World War II, um, we looked at the world differently, lots of different ways. We were forced to think about race a little differently. There was a musical that was written uh, in those years right after the war. Uh, Oscar Hammerstein wrote uh, some lyrics for a musical which is called South Pacific. Most of you have seen South Pacific, right? which explores, um, one of the themes, a uh, big one for it, is uh, exploring uh, racism and how that works. A generation later, one of my uh, favorite artists, a guy named Michael Johnson, uh, put it to music like this. You have got to be taught to hate and fear day after day year after year it's got to be drummed in your dear little ears you've got to be taught to hate and fear you have got to be taught before it's too late before you are six or seven or eight to hate all the people your relatives hate. You've got to be carefully taught. We can teach hate and fear, or we can teach love and acceptance. But too much is at stake for us to remain silent. The book of Revelation is full of images. Uh, many of them are not literal, they're, they're symbolic. But I think this image that we have of people of every tribe and language, of, uh, of every uh, nation gathered around the throne is given to inspire us to work towards that vision. The power to conquer sin and death does not belong to us. That belongs to the Lamb. But for we who would follow, the path is set before.